because we're seeing the censorship of opinion, the censorship of view, wherever we look, from political correctness to people being banned from speaking in public because what they say is at odds with what the government would like people to hear. And um, here's a few quotes about censorship, uh, which are very timely in the current environment of suppression and oppression of freedom. Censorship is to art as lynching is to justice. When truth is replaced by silence, the silence is a lie. Absolutely right. What is freedom of expression? Without the freedom to offend, it ceases to exist. And even the freedom not to offend these days, as more and more um, people who challenge the official version and the official narrative are blocked from speaking in public and more and more communicating on the internet and social media. One from um, President Kennedy, JFK. Public libraries, in other words, public discourse, should be open to all except the censor. But of course, what we're seeing is the opposite of that. And censorship is about fear, the fear of the censor or fear by the censor, because all censors are frightened people. That's why they want to censor. They are terrified of others hearing information that they don't want them to hear. I don't want to censor anybody. I'm not saying people shouldn't say this about me or shouldn't say that about me. Say what you bloody like, I don't care. Because freedom of speech, to state the obvious, is freedom of speech. It's not the freedom to say um, up to this point, but not beyond it. Because if you can't go beyond it, then there is no freedom of speech for anyone, just the freedom to conform within the parameters of what is thought to be acceptable. Now, I'm not talking about uh, inciting violence and all that, because there are, there are other laws um, to deal with that. I'm talking about the right to question and put another view on everything. And then let people, the listener, decide what they make of it. Instead of authority, terrified of the truth coming out, dictating what people will hear or not hear so they don't have that freedom, even the, the hearer of making a decision on information based on what they think instead of what the state wants them to think. And all this is, um, like I say, it's about fear. And there's another couple of quotes uh, about that. Um, a word to the unwise, and censors are deeply um, unwise. Torch every book, char every page, burn every word to ash. Ideas are incombustible, and therein lies your real fear. Exactly. And one final one. When you tear out a man's tongue, you are not proving him a liar. You're just telling the world that you fear what he might say. And here I am, apparently a nutter, completely mad, who people are frightened of, talking about the censor mentality, in terms of what I might say. And there is a theme to this, which has been continued this week, 
in terms of one major aspect of this gathering censorship. And that is the, um, the blocking of criticism of the state of Israel and its government. You know, when you want to silence people as much as Israel does and its apologists and its gophers, then you must have something big time to hide. If you are not confident enough of your position that you will not allow open discourse but want to censor, other views. We've had um, the uh, changed definition now of anti-Semitic to include basically criticism of Israel and its government and criticism of Zionism which is a political movement and the UK government has accepted this new definition and it's having a major effect on the ability, not least of people in universities, to um, question and criticise the behaviour, some of it absolutely appalling, of the Israeli government and what it stands for. And this week, of course, we had the stunningly narcissistic president of France, Emmanuel Macron, standing side by side with the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, saying that anti-Semitism can be equated with being against the behaviour of Zionism. These were his words. We will not surrender to hate. So Israel uh, or the Israeli regime does not hate Palestinians then and does not behave towards them on the basis of that hatred? Never gets a mention. See, the Israel regime never hates and is never racist. It's not possible. Only everyone else does. And, and uh, Macron went on. We will not surrender to anti-Zionism because it is a reinvention of anti-Semitism. Now, the sinister nature of that statement, and indeed the redefinition of anti-Semitism, um, is extraordinary because um, it's saying that you are equating hatred, racial hatred, with criticism of a government and criticism of a political philosophy. This is beyond Orwell. And by the way, you know, the, the way these terms are thrown around and people then accept that that's what they mean, anti-Semitic um, does not refer exclusively to Jewish people. The term Semitic um, comes from a, a, a language group of peoples, overwhelmingly in the Middle East, and by far, 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 far the overwhelming majority of Semitic people are Arabic people. Even the term is a misnomer. And so we now have a, a situation where, and this is a question worth asking, you know, I mean, it is in front of our, our face and, you know, therefore it should be seen, but isn't. How come a country of 8 million people, less than the size of London, out of 7.5 billion, has such power and influence in the world and such um, power to censor using its network of gophers around the world? It's just, um, again, extraordinary. And isn't that a question worth asking? 
what if the country was um, 8 million African people or Chinese people or Russian people? Would, would people then be saying, well, hold on, how do they get so much power? They're so few compared with the population of the world. These are the questions, you see, that this censorship is desperate to stop people asking because of where it will lead. So, what is happening, and I've, I've got my own personal experience from this week, which I'll come to, what happens is, when people are um, wishing to debate uh, the behavior of Israel, the apartheid of Israel in terms of the Palestinians, when they um, uh, wish to um, to criticize Israel in any way, then there is a process that starts whereby the venue of the event is contacted. And uh, the following happens. This is, a, um, this is a, a, a wonderful blueprint of how this works. And uh, it's a story that involves the uh, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions uh, organization movement, BDS which is campaigning for a global boycott of Israel until it withdraws from illegally occupied um, Palestinian lands. Now, some countries, many states of the United States, um, have um, uh, passed laws banning um, government contracts with any uh, company that takes part in this boycott. So people, therefore, do not have, without financial sanction um, uh, upon them, the right to choose whether they um, boycott Israel or whether they don't. Now, how, how, how many other countries in the world are protected in that way from people choosing to boycott them? What is this power that Israel has on such a scale? So this is the process of what happens. Um, there was an event planned by um, BDS in Austria. Uh, it was part of a Israel apartheid week that's held every uh, year to highlight the fact that there is racial apartheid in Israel with regard to the Palestinians. It's, it's called freedom of expression, or should be. And what happened in this case, and I mentioned this case, but this is the blueprint that, that um, leads to censorship. Um, it was cancelled, the, the event they were having, by a hotel after the hotel received, quote, incessant calls, some by those identifying themselves as representatives of the Jewish community in Austria, according to BDS Austria, these people had, um, uh, the quote goes on, had issued threats and allegations of anti-Semitism against um, hotel staff. So if you're having these people uh, talking about apartheid in, um, in Israel, then you must be uh, a racist. This is the mentality we're dealing with. Not very bright. But again, they don't want to see the truth because the lie suits them better. Um, and um, they were issuing um, threats, uh, the um, BDS Austria said, um, and allegations of anti-Semitism against hotel staff, as well as announcing, without further detail, protest actions and boycott calls against the hotel. The hotel management felt threatened by this to the extent of asking for police protection. And, and this is the the process that goes on behind the scenes that people don't know about that leads to um, these events and speaking events being cancelled by venues because they're intimidated by this. Instead of calling the police and saying, it's, we're being threatened here, we're being intimidated, sort these people out. No, no, the, 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 the backbone goes, turns to jelly, starts to wobble. And then what they do, most of them anyway, these uh, venues, they, they give you an excuse for cancelling the event that is actually not the truth. In, in the case of this one, 
Um, a spokesman for the um, Austrian hotel told the media they'd received unpleasant calls um, as a result of having this um, BDS event on, but they later gave the reason to cancel the event as being unable to, to um, accommodate such a large public event. <clears throat> of course, the real reason is that they were intimidated by the threats they received. And you see, it's this gutlessness that allows um, these um, censors, these playground bullies, to prevail and silence a basic human freedom, freedom of expression. Because it's not them, ultimately, that censor. Oh, they'll contact the venue and they'll lie and they'll threaten. But the people that ultimately censor are not them, but the gutless people at venues, which then um, wobble and deny freedom of speech because it suits them in the situation they face. Which brings me to Canada. Um, I've had a lot of problems in Canada over the years from this low-life mafia in Canada who um, wish to dictate what Canadians can and cannot hear because um, when it comes to arrogance, uh, these people have no limits. So anyway, I've not spoken in Canada for a long time because of this. Uh, but then I'm on a, a world speaking tour um, where I've spoken in country after country after country after country with no problem. And so we applied for another um, visa to speak in Canada, see what would happen. And the, the federal government after a while, gave me a visa to speak in Canada. So I should therefore be allowed to speak in Canada, but it's not that simple. Um, we booked a venue in Toronto, um, speaking there at the end of the month, also in, uh, the following week in Vancouver. And um, then after a while, this venue suddenly pulled out, and the, the excuse made no sense, so we, the alarm bell started to ring. We went to another venue, um, and it's called the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Now, this is the background to it um, from its own website. Uh, it's the creation um, uh, of a, a joint venture between um, the federal government of Canada, who gave me the frickin' visa to speak, the province of Ontario and the authority of the metropolitan uh, um, area of Toronto. Um, this this is the the people that these are the people that ultimately um, run the Metro Toronto Convention Centre, but it's run directly by a so-called um, independent board. And it says on their website, the Metro Toronto Convention Centre complies and is accountable with all government requirements, except freedom of speech. Oh, sorry, that's not a government inquiry uh, uh, requirement, especially in bloody Canada, in my experience. Uh, the president and CEO of this um, convention center is uh, apparently called Barry Smith. And uh, presumably he and his mates made this decision. And um, on the website, davidike.com website version of this um, uh, video cast, I've got a link underneath it to, um, to the website of this um, organization. And maybe respectfully, people might inquire why this um, Metro Toronto Convention Center has such utter contempt for freedom of speech because we booked this uh, venue in April. April, we're heading fast to August now. And um, we had this email. And by the way, I've got no problem with the person we've been working with, they're very nice but they didn't make the decision. Uh, it says, we are happy to have the opportunity to host the worldwide wake up tour on the 27th uh, of August, 2017. Please find attached the contract and corresponding documents for your 2017 event. Notification that the event was on was on their website. 
Um, tickets have been on sale since April. They've almost uh, virtually gone. People have booked hotels. Some people have even booked flights to this uh, event, which has been accepted by the venue and which um, has been um, publicised since April. This week, as a result of a single letter from this low-life mafia censorship network in Canada, the Toronto Metro Convention Centre told us they were cancelling the event. Now, we're looking at other venues now. And we'll be coming back to ticket holders, which are very large in number, um, as soon as we can. So here we have a government-owned uh, public venue cancelling an event which they've accepted for months on the basis of a single letter complaining that I'm being allowed to speak. Um, who sent that letter? We're not allowed to know. What does the letter say? We're not allowed to know. We had references from other venues, because we've been speaking around the world now since June last year. Been brilliant. Venues who've had the events on have, have, have said to the Metro Centre, it's fine, it's not a problem. But one letter from these Playground bullies led them to decide, higher up from those that we were dealing with, that I wasn't going to be allowed to speak. And the only thing we've been told is that the decision was taken because of fear of a public backlash. This is a public backlash which has not happened at any other venue in any other country that I have spoken uh, in and at since June last year. So obviously in the letter it said there'll be a public backlash. And so here we have this public venue owned by the government with absolute contempt for freedom of speech and absolute contempt for the people who have bought tickets, booked hotels and booked flights. This is how easy it is to destroy freedom of expression. And like I say, it's not the low-life censors that ultimately do it. It's the jelly backboned venue owners and governments that concede to that, which is the ultimate form of censorship. And anybody that cares about freedom of expression for themselves who doesn't care about freedom of expression for others doesn't believe in freedom and I'll tell you another irony there are for you actually but this Metro Toronto Convention Centre has hosted G20 summits I wonder if they thought about cancelling that for fear of a public backlash. No, they just surrounded it in fences and, and, and police lines. Because freedom of speech ultimately lies with the establishment. You see, you can go to the metro centre and you can at a G20 summit and you can call for the bombing of this country and, and attacks on this and attacks on that. You can call for global policies that destroy lives and um, 
destroy countries. And that's fine. Oh, that's right. That's fine. Oh, it's freedom of speech. But you, like I was going to do here, and I've been doing all around the world, if you say we need to put down the fault lines of race and religion and culture and, and, and income bracket and class and realize that we're being divided and ruled to an end. The end is the rule. Dividing us and playing us off against each other is how that rule comes about. Because we're so busy fighting each other. We don't see the, uh, the strings attached to us are the strings to attach to the people we're fighting. And they're held by the same hand. So I'm calling for people to stop seeing each other in terms of colour, in terms of race, in terms of background, and start looking at people as individuals, no matter what, where they come from, what, what they look like. What do they do? What do they say? Let's look at the person, not the, the garment we call a body. So that's what I was going to say at the Metro Centre. So it's worth asking this question. Um, if I am saying race is a, an irrelevant uh, means of dividing us because we're all one consciousness having different experiences and the people that are trying to stop me speak, uh, speaking are obsessed with race and um, self-identify totally with race. Who's the real racist here? Because it's not me. And this is the constant inversion you see all over the world where people claim one thing while being the absolute epitome of what they claim to oppose. And I would say this, you know, Canada, what are you going to do about it? Because the vast, vast, over one majority of people in Canada won't know this, but I've experienced it. I've experienced it since uh, the turn of the millennium in that country. There are people being censored all the time and targeted, not least legally, by those who are so arrogant that they want to dictate what you can and cannot hear because they fear what might happen if people knew the truth. And um, I, would, I, would, I would stress this to everyone in Canada and people in Germany, because that's just as bad. If you don't stand up for freedom of speech, you lose it. Whatever you don't stand up for, you will lose.